we're into the third part of our virology lecture where we are going to start talking about some of the viruses. And of course, in this course, we are only focusing on the viruses that actually cause human disease. So keep in mind there are many, many, many more viruses than those that we are covering. And we're actually not even covering every virus that causes human disease. Again, that could be an entire semester long course. We're just focusing on some of the more major viruses that there um, patients could be infected with and that there is a serological based test that you might perform or a different type of assay that you might perform in a clinical laboratory. So we're starting out with our double-stranded DNA viruses. And the first uh, group we're going to talk about are the adenoviruses. Adenoviruses are in the adenoviridae family. Again, double-stranded DNA virus. There are at least 49 serotypes that have been described. And adenoviruses cause a variety of diseases. They can cause pharyngitis. They can cause pneumonia. They tend to cause upper respiratory tract dis uh, diseases. And they're transmitted through the respiratory tract, through aerosols, fecal orally, as well as direct contact. Now, the adenoviruses actually cause less than 5% of all of the acute respiratory diseases. Serotypes 40 and 41 actually cause gastroenteritis in children, so they can cause intestinal symptoms. And in the laboratory, you, if you were to grow up an adenovirus for diagnosis, you would use the HEP2 cell lines. Now another big family, herpes viridae. Again, another double-stranded DNA genome. This organism ha is, has a capsid that has a icosahedral shape and it is enveloped. Now there are eight human herpes viruses that are currently known. So there's herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, there's varicella zoster virus, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, human herpes virus 6, 7, and 8, and human herpes virus 8 is also known as the Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. So now we're going to talk about some of these herpes viruses. So herpes simplex virus 1 and 2. These viruses are transmitted through direct contact with infected secretions. They can and, and many times do remain latent. So many people are latently infected with herpes simplex virus. And these viruses remain latent in the sensory nerve ganglia cells. The diseases that they cause, herpes simplex virus 1 causes oral herpes, which can is your general um, cold sores that you might get on the on your lip, the outside of your mouth. Herpes simplex virus 1 can also cause genital herpes, although that's less common. Normally it's going to cause just your cold sores. It can also cause pharyngitis, conjunctivitis, encephalitis in severe cases, and it can disseminate. Herpes simplex virus 2 is the cause of a sexually transmitted infection of genital herpes. So this is the more common herpes that's going to lead to genital herpes. This is a sexually transmitted infection. It, you can get a disseminated terrible disease in newborn infants from transplacental tra uh, transmission. Detection of herpes simplex virus 1 or 2 can be cell culture, can be an, an, immunos, an immunosorbent assay, and you could do some fluorescent antibody staining. Another herpes virus, the varicella zoster virus, or what's known as VZV 
Transmission is usually close personal contact and respiratory aerosols from an infected individual. Again, this virus can remain latent in the dorsal root ganglia. And the diseases that varicella zoster virus causes is chicken pox, which is known as varicella, or shingles, which is zoster. So a lot of little, little, little children used to always get chicken pox before there was a vaccine. So most people that are, that are over a certain age that weren't vaccinated did have chicken pox. Now this virus, once you're infected, can remain latent. And many years later, a lot of times in the elderly, it'll come back out as shingles. So chicken pox causes the, you know, pox lesions, these little pustules all over the body. Shingles usually only comes out on one side of the body along a nerve cell. So commonly it might be on someone's abdomen and only on one side in one area. Now, detection of varicella zoster virus could be your fluorescent antibody staining, cell culture, and cell vial culture. Usually, varicella zoster virus isn't tested for as much. It's usually you, you look at someone and you can tell that they have it, especially before the vaccine, because all kids ended up practically all kids ended up getting chicken pox. If you were like me, you got them when you were a little tiny baby and you didn't develop antibodies. And then I got chicken pox again when I was about 14. And then when I was in my early 20s, I got shingles on one, just one side of my body. It was very, very, very itchy. In some people, though, shingles can be incredibly painful. So luckily, mine wasn't super painful. It was just itchy. So here's classic chicken pox where you get these little pustules all over the body that can be very itchy. They tend to scab over, and then it goes away on its own. Usually pretty innocuous, not, not, normally not life-threatening in any way. And here are shingles, where it's usually one side of the body and in one location along one nerve cell. And again, a little rash can be very, very painful because it's nerve cells that are involved. For me, mine was on the right-hand side of my abdomen and was very, very itchy. Now, Epstein-Barr virus, another one of these viruses Transmission is through close contact, usually with infected saliva. This virus remains latent in B lymphocytic cells. The diseases that it causes are infectious mononucleosis, or what's called mono. It can also cause the what's called oral hairy leukoplakia in HIV infected patients. Now the other thing about Epstein-Barr virus, it does remain latent. Pretty much everyone by the time they're about 23 or 25 has been infected with Epstein-Barr virus and most of us probably haven't even had mono or any symptoms. But the Epstein-Barr virus does remain latent and there has been strong associations between Epstein-Barr virus and certain types of cancers such as Burkitt's lymphoma and nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Another virus, herpes virus, is cytomegalovirus, or CMV. Transmission is through close contact with sec secretions, through blood and organ transfusions, as well as vertical, from mother to infant. The site of latency of CMV is endothelial cells and white blood cells. Now, cytomegaloviral infections can be completely asymptomatic or they can cause an infectious mononucleosis-like disease. Diagnosis, 
cell culture, shell, vi shell vial, fluorescent antibody staining, PCR, and EIA. So I used to do ELISA testing for CMV in the laboratory. Now human herpes viruses 6 and 7. Transmission is respiratory. Most children are infected by the age of 2 or 3. The, these viruses remain latent in the T lymphocytes, specifically in the CD4 cells. And her, human herpes virus 6 and 7 can cause a number of type, different types of diseases. It can cause roseola, fever, tired, rash, low white blood cell count. And it's usually detected through cell culture or PCR. Human herpes virus 8, the last of the herpes viruses. This is a sexually transmitted infection. Um, the, the details of transmission are not completely known and it's the diseases that are linked with it are what leads people to believe that transmission is through sexual contact. So the site of latency is endothelial cells and the virus has been isolated from tumor cells from individuals with a, um, a disease called Kaposi's sarcoma. So Kaposi's sarcoma used to be a common type of um, cancer in men in the Mediterranean. It was not very common in the United States until the 80s when HIV was identified. That's one of the ways HIV was identified. All of a sudden, these young people started getting Kaposi sarcoma, which was a very, very rare, almost unheard of cancer in the United States. So all of a sudden, in these um, urban areas, men were getting Kaposi sarcoma. And you'd get five and six and seven different men with Kaposi sarcoma where physicians normally would never have seen a single patient. So it got people thinking something's going on and that's when um, a lot of the epidemiological studies were done and linkages were done and it, so Kaposi sarcoma is a common cancer in HIV patients, although you can get it without being in HIV infected. And like I said, human herpes virus 8 has been isolated from these cells. So you can detect it through fluorescent in situ hybridization, or what's called FISH, as well as our PCR polymerase chain reaction. And here is a typical um, lesion that you would see in an individual with Kaposi sarcoma. And like I said, it used to be more common in older um, men that were born in the Mediterranean area in any of the Mediterranean countries. But um, now you can find it anywhere in individuals with um, more commonly with HIV. Another DNA virus is our um, family Papillomaviridae, which we have the virus HPV or human papillomavirus. Now with HPV, there are more than a hundred types of HPV that exist. Transmission is through direct contact as well as sexual contact. The site of latency of HPV is the epithelial tissue and HPV more commonly causes the disease genital warts. Although you can get warts on any other area of the skin, it can also cause benign head and neck tumors. So HPV is commonly diagnosed through an examination. So if you had genital warts and you went to a physician or a gynecologist, they would know just by looking at it that it's HPV and they'd likely treat you. However, you can do cytology-based tests. You can do um, ELISA-based tests. There are DNA probes to test for HPV. There's also now a vaccine 
So again, we said there are many, many types of HPV. There are certain types of HPV that have been highly associated with causing cervical cancer. So HPV has been associated with both cervical cancer and penile cancer, but there are specific types and a vaccine was made against these specific types that are associated with cervical, can cervical cancer in the hopes to reduce um, cervical cancer later in life because HPV is a very common virus and a lot of people become, inve become infected with HPV by the time they reach adulthood. Another family, the Poxviridae family, these are the largest virus. So you might want to put that in memory. The pox viruses, we already said, are the largest. The boards tend to like you to know that pox viruses are the largest of all the viruses. They're complex, they're bricked shaped brick-shaped virions, double-stranded DNA like all of these viruses we've been talking about. The diseases that the Poxviridae family of viruses causes are smallpox, molluscum contagiosum, and monkeypox. Transmission is through respiratory droplets. You can detect the pox viruses using electron microscopy from skin lesions because these pox viridae organisms cause pox uh, lesions on the skin, these little skin eruptions. And keep in mind that smallpox was eradicated in 1977. So we don't see individuals infected with smallpox. So this is not something you would be te testing for in a clinical uh, micro laboratory. So smallpox was the first disease to ever be eliminated through vaccination. Usually individuals would be exposed through inhalation, through skin direct contact, and in individuals that are infected with the smallpox virus, usually will get a fever, feel tired, not, you know, be sleepy, and get this very characteristic pox pustule rash. So the agent that causes smallpox is variola major. This is a very highly virulent organism that can, it's also can be highly fatal and variola major is considered a bio threat agent. Variola minor causes a similar disease to smallpox but it's much less virulent. Now once the vaccination was created against smallpox, everybody in the United States was vac vaccinated. However, in 1972, they stopped doing routine vaccinations. Now, in 2002, the vaccination was reintroduced, but only for um, military personnel and medical personnel. So anyone that would be at higher risk of coming into contact with smallpox. Now it is eradicated. We don't see smallpox infections. However, there, there are still smallpox organisms growing in research laboratories and it's thought that um, certain areas of the world have um, some smallpox, which is why it's considered a biothreat agent and there's still some work done being done on it. And so anyone who might work um, or do research or again, military personnel in combat who might get exposed to it are vaccinated against it. So I've actually been vaccinated um, against smallpox twice. Once when I was a little tiny baby and uh, again a couple of years ago when I worked in a biodefense laboratory. So we're going to move into the single-stranded DNA viruses. So we've been talking about the double-stranded DNA viruses and now we're going to single-stranded. We'll start out by talking about the parvoviruses and there's only one human parvovirus and that's parvovirus B19. 
So transmission of this virus is through respiratory aerosol and close contact with an infected individual. And parvovirus B19 causes the disease erythema infectiosum. Now this disease is more commonly called fifth disease and the reason it got nicknamed fifth disease is because it was the fifth childhood disease. So before all the vac vaccines came about all children used to come down with uh, chicken pox, measles, mumps, um, I'm forgetting the fourth one, and then this this disease which was nicknamed fifth disease. Now the problem with parvovirus B19 is that in, uh, pregnant women that get infected with it can pass it to their unborn child and end up having stillbirth. So parvovirus B19 is detected through ser serology tests, polymerase chain reaction, as well as histology. And here's the typical slapped cheek rash. So that's what it looks like. It looks like a, a person had their cheeks slapped. Their cheeks get bright, bright red with parvovirus B19 infection. We're now going to move on to the fourth part of our virology lecture.